Wave after wave of landing craft swept shoreward. Overhead, a screen of fighter planes formed a protective umbrella. The beach dead ahead, and still no sign of the enemy. First boats hit the shore without opposition. Not a man was lost in the landing operations on the island of Guadalcanal. But the ease of the landing and quick capture of the airfield from the Japanese would be followed by a casualty-filled six-month battle before ending with Allied victory. Tom Mohan was a dive bomber gunner for the first three months of that battle, and in this episode of History in the First Person, shares his memories of serving in the Cactus Air Force. So Tom, let's go back now. Did you understand about why you needed to go to Guadalcanal? Did you even know you were going to Guadalcanal? Had no idea of where it was, what it was, or anything like that. But, but uh, I went to six weeks of boot camp, a train ride to San Francisco, a boat ride to Hawaii, and I was sent to uh, an, an airfield. I didn't know the Marine Corps had aviation. But uh, after uh, three or four months there, uh, one day, someone said, well, come on, we're pack up, we're going for a boat ride. After a day or so out on a car converted carrier, they said, we're going to a place called Guadalcanal. And the boat you're going on is known as the USS Long Island. It's not a big boat. <laughs> not very big. <laughs> and so, like, are those all your planes, or what's yeah, on top? Yeah. That took up the, the room. It was just a converted carrier. That means... It, it, it wasn't as big as a, a regular carrier. It didn't have an elevator. Most carriers, it had an elevator to take planes down below to work on them. And it was so small, you couldn't, with 24 airplanes on it, you couldn't take off. You had to be catapulted off. And that means just thrown off the back end. So, so when, when eventually you get to Guadalcanal. Within 100 miles of it, they, it was too dangerous a water for the carrier to come into it. So we're catapulted off, and about 45-minute trip, you arrived at Guadalcanal. So now, you're in Hawaii before you go off to Guadalcanal. Is right. that when you f receive your first training then as a gunner? Because, yes, yes. Okay, so what caused you to say, you'd never flown before. No. So, Tom, why did you just say, decide, oh, right, I'll become a gunner? What was that about? I wanted to fly. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, we were not ready for that war. And... Uh, uh, when I got there, I pictured, uh, I'm not a mechanic, but I pictured uh, washing uh, airplane parts or pushing airplanes around. So I, I thought I want to find something a little better and, and found out that they have a, a gunner. Uh, it's, it, the plane is a two-man plane. Small, had to be small enough to land on a carrier. That's me. That's and, you right uh, there in the gunner. And yeah. so at that point, is, we're actually, you're actually facing the back of the plane, right? Yes, facing the tail. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, two, the guns were 20, 30, 30 cal two 30 caliber uh, machine guns. They'd swivel around. You could lean back to shoot up. You could stand up to shoot down. But the tail was awfully close. You had to be careful not to hit it. And, and so prior to deciding I'm going to become this gunner guy, you hadn't been up in a plane, what qualified you to be a gunner, Tom? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> Except I asked him, uh, what do you have to do to get to fly? And they said, you have to learn a Morse code, eight words a minute, at least eight words a minute. And uh, I qualified, uh, and uh, that was it. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, we started uh, learning how, what, 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 it's the first time in an airplane. I've never been in an airplane in my life. And this so, is a model of the actual plane, correct? Yes. I'll let yes. you hold that as, as, yes. as we begin to talk about it. And so the pilot would fly up here, and the pilot you worked with was? Arthur O'Keefe was his name. And how did you guys get picked to go together? Was it just blind luck or? Just, just luck. Yeah. Okay. We were, we were just assigned. And uh, his name was Arthur O'Keefe. He was right out of flight school. I was right out of boot camp. So we didn't know much about, well, he knew how to, he had about 50 hours flying time and uh, I'd never been in one before. And so the, the machine gun in the back could rotate back and forth and go up and down. Yes. And you always had to be careful not to hit the tail fin, right. obviously. And it was a little bit obsolete. It could do 250 miles an hour, they said. And, uh, but a Jap Zero could do 400 miles an hour. 
So we were fighting like the poor Indian was. He was using a uh, bow and arrow and we were using rifles. And uh, so uh, d it wasn't uh, the way the movies might show you, the dog fighting. Uh, this type of plane, uh, to, to attack someone, another plane, we'd get take off, fly above the clouds, try and do the job, and get back low on the water so that a zero couldn't get behind you or underneath you. Now you were dealing, you mentioned that you weren't dealing with dogfights, but this was a, a plane that, was, that would dive bomb, correct? It, it was meant for that. They drop the bomb and, and pull away. So the goal was you come, you actually dive, because you've got one bomb strapped to the bottom of the plane. Right, a thousand pounder. So a thousand pound bomb, pound bomb is strapped to the bottom of the plane. The goal is to dive as close to the ship as you can to drop the bomb. Right. And then are other planes offering you air coverage? Like are they fighting? Supposedly. <laughs> Supposedly, the way it was supposed to work, that a, a dive bomber came in lengthwise on the ship, a torpedo plane come in on the side, and a fighter plane was there to protect you. But uh, the, the fighter planes didn't want to tangle with zeros. Uh, they were too valuable to try and stop the bombers. The bombers come over every day. So their job was to try and stop them. And we didn't have any torpedo planes. And so it was, uh, you had a nice target though, the length of the ship. You come in uh, and uh, uh, drop the bomb from about, you start out about 7,000 feet. Otherwise, you needed oxygen if you went a little higher. And, and you had a nice long target, not too wide, but uh, you, you were within 500 feet when you pulled away from it. Our purpose was to damage ships, to stop ships from coming in to land troops on Guadalcanal. Let me stop so, you there for a minute. I've got a map I want to bring up which gives you an idea of the various kinds of things that were happening. This is a closer up version of Guadalcanal, and you'll notice right here is Henderson Field. That's the airstrip right. where Mr. Mohan and his compatriots are going to be working from. But all of these, all of these arrows that you see represent naval engagements and naval movements. So the red lines are Japanese ship movements. The blue lines are allied movements. You see aircraft carriers and other kinds of ships out there. They're engaging in warfare back and forth. Planes are doing fighting back and forth, and your job is to try to disrupt the Japanese right. so you can either land troops on Guadalcanal or move them to somewhere right. else in the Pacific that you want troops to go. Right. Well, now, did you have to worry, were the Japanese constantly attacking the airstrip? Yes, they were. And uh, uh, they, they attacked it every night uh, with destroyers, cruisers, and uh, you never forget if you heard a 14-inch shell going over your head. Uh, that's the, the biggest, uh, compared to an American ship that would shoot 14 inch shells. But it sounded like a boxcar going over your head end over end. But there was no particular target. There was nothing special there except a runway and a pagoda, a Japanese pagoda on top of a hill. That was the only targets. Everything else could be repaired. When they bombed the runway, it was, it was gravel. It could be patched up during the night. We've got some footage of actually, newsreel footage of the Japanese bombing the runway. So you yeah. wanted to get some examples of the kind of combat. The Japanese were bombing the airstrip daily, on a daily yes, basis. Yes. And so when you were landing planes and taking off, you were constantly having to deal, I guess, with big potholes. I mean, yeah. you were resurfacing the airstrip all the time. Right, right. And why did it matter so much that you had control of this airstrip in Guadalcanal? Because the battles of Guadalcanal are pretty vicious. There's a lot of fighting going on here. Why did it matter so much? Well, the Japanese were on their way to New Zealand and Australia, and they were going from island to island, and, and which, where they, which they could do with a small plane. A uh, carrier could carry a, a small planes, but they wanted to hop, go from island to island, and, and they were some... doing fine until we stopped them at Guadalcanal. Yes, that was, and we saw some damaged planes there, yeah. and actually, it wasn't like you were getting resupplies constantly, correct? No, no. You had a limited amount of planes, and so if some plane got damaged in some way, you had to like take parts off of it True. to fix the plane that you had. And True. there you guys see really good visuals of the airstrip itself right there. Yeah. Not a very long strip, basically no. just dirt and gravel. And there was, not, there was no information or no such thing as radar. It was by radio, the Australian coast watchers, they called them, were in the jungles further north. And when bombers, when they'd see bombers in the air coming down, they let us know by radio, and we'd, what they called scramble, we'd get everything off the ground. We'd fly our planes off the road, get out to sea for a while, 
until they'd, they'd, they'd gone. And it gave our fighter pilots, which there were only 12, a chance to, uh, uh, to stop them, to damage them. Did you fly both day and night? No, not, not, not that night. You had an exhaust, a shard exhaust. And you'd be like fireflies up there in, in the dark, and, and, and you never knew what was on the water. The Japanese had control of all the water, the, of the whole South Pacific for a while. And uh, so uh, it would be very dangerous to fly at night. They could shoot at you, and you wouldn't know where they were. We're going to bring up some images. We've got a number of images of you at Guadalcanal, or you in different <laughs> stages of uniform. And as, and, and as we talk about this, talk a little bit about the nature of the condition. Describe what the living conditions were That's, like for you That guys. was uh, when our equipment finally got there after a week or so. Okay. We were sleeping under the wing of the plane, and the mechanics were too. So that was when it first came in and was piled up for everybody to go get his own sea bag. And, and uh, we were in tents like MASH, like if you ever seen the uh, TV program of MASH, you know what size tents they had. And there were six or eight of us in, in every tent in the foxhole behind it. And it's August 1942. It's hot? I mean, you're in the South Pacific. I'm assuming it's pretty hot yes, it's and warm. humid. And did you have to deal with, I mean, were we talking mosquitoes and bugs? And I mean, did you, I mean, what was, did you have to worry about, I don't know, Malaria or mosquitoes? Yes. Or, had you gotten all your shots, so to speak? No one ever left there without malaria and diarrhea. And, and uh, the food, uh, I, that's the way you lived. And some people cut the shark, the dungarees off and made shards out of them. And that's the size tent. And uh, the food was two meals a day. One was pancakes. And the second one was, uh, I was curious one day and I, wanted, I went up to the cook shack to see what they had to eat eaten and I saw 10 gallon cans with uh, something about that long and, and, and maybe a little thick and found out it was lamb's tongue, just the tongues, whole cans of them, but we had a wonderful cook. He knew what to do with them. He boiled them, he fried them, he uh, made patties out of them and so if you didn't, hadn't gone up to the cook's tent to see what they looked like, it wasn't bad. <laughs> but, but, but that was the meal every day for uh, two and a half months. What did you guys do to entertain yourselves? Well, if you, uh, that, that year was the streetcar series. The Browns played the Cardinals. For those of you who are not from St. Louis, um, that's, yeah. the year, that's the year that both the St. Louis Browns and the St. Louis Cardinals made the World Series at the same yes. time and, and faced each other. And, and uh, so they called that the streetcar series because not many people had full tank of gas to, to get to them. But, uh, but that was the, the information I wanted to hear, is who's, wi who's winning today? And uh, then they had a propaganda program, Tokyo Rose, she was called. You know, she was, it was just propaganda, trying to worry you. And so you, we, had, so you, you could listen to the radio? Yeah, once in a while. Once yeah. in a while. Yeah. But like, it wasn't like, did you ever get letters or from home or anything like no, that? No, no, no. So the no, only- Well, I didn't write much either. Okay. Oh. So, but uh, that was my fault. But uh, uh, so then, when you weren't working uh, or f in the middle of flights or repairing, I mean, did guys just play cards? How did y'all entertain yourselves? I mean, well, you're in the jungle; it's a very different environment. And, than and we to. had, to, as, as as being flying as gunners, you had to be ready. They had uh, they, what they called on a ship that called a ready room. But here, you just sat in a big tent. You had to be ready any time that radio man up in the jungle called and said bombers were coming, you had to just hurry to the plane, take off, get the, get the plane off the ground for safety's sake. So uh, that was your, your day, was just sitting there waiting. But uh, so we had some old magazines from, from someplace or other, so we would thumb through them. And uh, uh, we're looking at the same magazine and said, what are we gonna have for lunch today? And he said, well, there's a nice big ad about ham. <laughs> and I said, well, I want some ham today. <laughs> and you wanted some chicken today. And we'd argue about that. that, that no, we knew what we were going to have. Lamb tongue. It was going to be lamb tongue and hardtack. <laughs> and hardtack was a, 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 a size of a graham cracker, but a, lot, a little thicker. But it was good, good uh, grain in it, you know. That, well, that's me on the right side. Lower right? Lower right. And the guy next to me, he was 17. I don't know how he lied to get in, but he used to work out, so he looked a little older than he was. 
And so that's you, that, that's it. Is, are those life preservers you guys are wearing? Yes, yes. And so I see the goggles. They, they off. call them May West. Ah, okay. They had a, uh, an oxygen bottle in it. Mm -hmm. If you needed it, you pulled the string on it, and it would inflate. But you were there for three months, August to October. Right. August, August uh, 19th till the 13th of October. And then, and was that just like a regular rotation? I mean, was, was there a reason you all left at the, after three months, or was that the plan all the time, or did no, you even know? The, the plan was just to keep somebody there. That, okay, that, so that, other pilots were continually coming in to keep the airstrip open? Once, yeah, we'd, uh, uh, the whole outfit would come, not okay. just... Oh, so but, like uh, a whole squadron. The whole come. squadron. Yeah. And how many? What is a squadron made up of? Oh, uh, about 150 people. Okay. And well, with this size, it was 12 planes, fighter or dive bomber, and the ground crews, two or three people for every plane, the cooks, the office people. So it all come to about 150 people. So after October, then you came back to the United States and back to San Diego. Yes. Yes. And what happened then? I wanted to stay in the Marine Corps. I wanted to go to flight school and they approved of it. And uh, I got a letter uh, about two months later, three months later, to come to Athens, Georgia to flight school. The only trouble, I was in the hospital with two broken legs. I'd been hitchhiking to Los Angeles and uh, I, I must have stepped out too far in the dim out. People had their headlights taped, the top of their headlights were taped because uh, uh, the, the Highway 101 ran a lot along the highway, the coast, ran right? by the ocean, and, and they were afraid submarines could see traffic going up and down the highway. And uh, uh, so people, uh, I assumed that somebody just didn't see me and hit, ran over me and broke both legs. So I spent about a year and a half at Long Beach Naval Hospital with casts up to here, you know. So that my war was over, and that mean, in that time, President Roosevelt died, and we had dropped the atomic bomb. And I uh, tried to stay in, they said, no, we don't need you. And, uh, and they discharged me. So altogether, I had three and a half years in the Marines. And in those three months of service in Guadalcanal, do you have any idea how many ships you destroyed or sank? Oh, 11, we sank 11 ships. Wow. Sank. And uh, they, they tried to claim credit for a submarine, but nobody was ever sure. But <laughs> you, you didn't see the oil slick, so they couldn't claim it. But, uh, uh, and thanks to our Navy, there was a guy named Bull Halsey that was a Navy commander. Uh, he started winning battles, Carl C., and uh, uh, it took control of the, of the South Pacific. 